If you don't mind, grab your Bibles. Let's see what the Lord would say to us today. Myron, if you can give me just a little bit of help in, in these monitors for me. Thank you so much, sir. We're going to read from two passages of Scripture. Two passages of Scripture. Uh, Matthew 28 and also out of John chapter number 12. Matthew 28 and John 12. got the word just holler at me and say I've got the word you don't have to say wait on me oh I hear you all right must be some Samsung users out there today God bless your hearts <laughs> Matthew 28 listen uh, if y'all wouldn't mind let's stand for the reading of the word of the Lord today if that's all right with you Matthew 28, reading out of the Amplified Version. Oh, and let me do this. While you all are standing, I got to celebrate the fact that my grandmother, Day Day Jeffy Hicks, is back in the house with us today. She is the eldest member of the church by a, a country mile. She's 103 years old, and we thank God for her. God has kept her. She's one person I know who has literally seen two pandemics, two global pandemics, and is still here to tell the story. So we honor God for her. And God, thank God for her caregiver that's here with her today as well. We thank God. Matthew 28, here's what the word of the Lord would say to us today. Matthew 28. And here's how it reads again out of the Amplified Version. Now after the Sabbath, near dawn of the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala, and the other Mary went to take a look at the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the boulder back and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his garments as white as snow. And those keeping guard were so frightened at the sight of him that they were agitated and they trembled and became like dead men. They passed out. But the angel said to the woman, do not be alarmed or frightened, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. As he said he would do. Come and see the place where he lay or come see the place where he used to lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Then in John chapter number 12, verse number 32, here's what the word of the Lord would say to us. John 12, verse 32. Jesus said, and I, if and when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, will draw and attract all men, Gentiles, as well as Jews, to myself. And I, if and when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, will draw and attract all men. Gentiles as well as Jews. That means everybody is included to myself. And that's the word of the Lord. You can be seated. As you all know, we've been in this series uh, over the course of this month called The Climb. And uh, we're, we're, I want to stay in that series today. Uh, and I, I want to talk to us from the subject, the glory of the ascent. The glory of the ascent. The glory of the ascent. I believe that this is it's probably a little bit more of a weighty title than y'all were looking for on an Easter Sunday morning, but 
Uh, I believe that that's what the Lord is saying to us today, that there is glory in the climb. There is something that you're going to see. There is a revelation of God that we are going to be able to talk about and really extract from our experience if we are willing and dutiful with regard to making the climb, with ascending into the place that God has called us to. The Passover or Easter or the Resurrection Sunday, whichever uh, you prefer, that season is the most celebrated time in the life of every believer. This is the time of the year where believers around the world all recognize the sacrifice that Jesus made to take away the sin of the world. Jesus gave himself as ransom for all sins and all people, past, present, and future. And it's impossible to discuss the idea of ascending in this series and not discuss the ultimate ascent. That's the climb that Jesus made. Now hear me, we, in, in this series we've been talking about climbs that man makes and we've been talking about the mountains that God does not give you permission to speak to. There are some mountains in Mark chapter number 11, the Bible tells us that uh, if we believe, we can speak to the mountain and say, be removed and be cast into the midst of the sea, and it will be done for us. This, these are the words of Jesus, that there are some mountains that you will not have to climb. There are some battles you will not have to fight. All you literally have to do is speak to it, and it will remove itself from your path. But all mountains are not defeated by your voice. Some must be conquered by your feet. And as a result of that reality, one of the things we have to understand is each of us has a mountain or two or ten to climb. Yes? But, but the climb that we are making really pales in comparison to the climb that Jesus had to make. Jesus went down in prayer in the garden on the day that he was betrayed. And from the time he rose from prayer, he kept ascending until he ended up on the cross. Say it again. Jesus went down in prayer. And from the posture of prayer or preparation, everything that happened subsequent to that was, a, uh, God, was Jesus traversing the path that led him to the place where he was ultimately hanged on a tree. So we have to understand then that part of our assignment today, part of my assignment today is to kind of help us understand, to look at this particular uh, time in the life of Jesus and look at the path that he took in order to ultimately make the most important sacrifice that could ever be made. Jesus was betrayed by Judas in the garden and he was taken to be before the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees so that they could dispense in their minds the bane of their existence. If you really look into the text, one of the things that you'll discover is the enemies of Jesus were sick of him by this point. Jesus had been so God in man, God in flesh on the earth, that he had literally upended religious ideology. He even upended political ideology. Jesus' presence alone was an annoyance, an irritant to those people who were accustomed to the status quo. Let me say that again. We are not really emblematic of Jesus if we don't upset the apple cart. Okay, Y'all don't like that. The, the, the truth is, the truth is, if we're really representative of Jesus, if we're really, watch this, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter number 8 that we're being conformed to his image so that he is the mold and we're being molded into the mold. If we don't disrupt things, if we don't turn over some tables in the temple, if we don't mess with the political regime of the day, we're probably not doing our assignments. Y'all don't like this kind of preaching. But Jesus was a disruptor. 
That was his job. He disrupted the plan of the enemy. He disrupted sin. He disrupted sickness and disease. He disrupted demonic oppression. Long-standing demonic forces had to give up their territory when Jesus showed up. And that was literally emblematic of the role that Jesus played his entire life. So by the time the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees got a hold of Jesus, they were so over him, they were willing to trump up charges to get rid of him. Watch the, watch the path. They called him the so-called king of the Jews. And now he's been turned over to be falsely accused and turned over to be beaten and even after Pontius Pilate tried to absolve Jesus, and he said to his accusers, he said, I find no fault with this man. You, you bring accusation, but upon having a conference with him, one of the things I've discovered is what you're saying about him is not what I've experienced about him. And the Bible says that Pontius Pilate washed his hands in front of the people and said, whatever happens next ain't on me. And he said, I'm going to give y'all a way out. There's a man named Barabbas who is a known criminal, a known murderer. I'm going to put him up against Jesus. It shouldn't even be a contest. Barabbas or Jesus. And they said, give us the killer. Give us the thief. Give us the murderer and crucify Jesus. And as a result, Pontius Pilate gave Jesus over to be beaten to literally a place where he could not be recognized. Okay, y'all, I, I need y'all to grab a hold of this. We've seen the movies. You know, we, we've, we've seen uh, 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 the passion of Christ and, and we've seen Jesus, you know, the, the, the miniseries and all those guys. But they pale in comparison to really describe how brutal a beating Jesus took, and yet he ascended. Okay. The, the, the Bible says in Isaiah 52 and 14 that his visage or his appearance was marred more than any man. In other words, he was completely unrecognizable. The only reason why they knew it was Jesus is because he was the same man they started beating on in the beginning. That's how they knew it was still him. They beat him to a bloody pulp, and he kept ascending. Y'all got to grab a hold of this. We get mad when people talk about us. We'll go off about an Instagram post. We will lose it over a, uh, over a sub tweet. I wish I had a few talk back people in here. We, we'll get angry if we hear a rumor of a rumor. And Jesus took a physical beating to the point where he was unrecognizable. They beat him with the cat of nine tails until the flesh was literally hanging off of him. And he kept getting up and he kept ascending. It's an incredible narrative to know that Jesus in his humanity probably should have gave up. Yet, he kept ascending. He kept going up and he did not stop moving until he got to Golgotha's hill or the place that we call Calvary it's also called the place of the skull the path that Jesus took to the cross is called the, the Via Dolorosa and that, that's what Kiwan and the dancers were just singing and dancing about and that, that Via Dolorosa is translated the way of suffering or the sorrowful way and it's the path that Jesus takes where we see his humanity on display just as much as we see his divinity on display. Y'all got to grab a hold to this. It is on this path that we see how human Jesus is. The fact that he can be beaten and bleed. You got to understand, uh, the Bible gives us no indication that Jesus sustained any injury in his life until this particular day. I'm going to say that again. I, I, I need y'all to grab a hold of this. Jesus had never had an injury from a biblical perspective until the day he allowed himself to be beaten for something he did not do. And he took this path the way 
of suffering. And the Bible tells us that on this path, uh, uh, he gets to the point where they put a cross on him. Now, it, this is an incredible burden that they put on anybody who was accused and, and, and uh, was convicted of a crime. You had to carry your cross to the place of crucifixion. The cross wasn't waiting on you. You had to take the cross with you. Okay. Y'all remember when Jesus said, if any man will follow me, he has to take up his his what? His cross and follow him. Wait a minute. So Jesus was telling us way back then that before your life is finished, if you're going to ascend, you don't ascend without a backpack called a cross. He had the cross on him and his humanity begins to show because the frailty of a beaten man is now being exposed because the Bible tells us that on this path, this Via Dolorosa, the Bible says that he crumbles under the weight of his own cross. While he's walking this path, he stumbles and he falls while carrying a cross. And the Bible says that there's a man named Simon of Cyrene, a black man. Okay, y'all, I need y'all to understand how much color is in the Bible. That's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But there's a black man named Simon, and the Bible says that they pick Simon and it says, hey, you come and carry his cross for him. And it, it, it gives Jesus somewhat of a reprieve while another innocent man carries a cross. Okay, I, I need y'all to grab a hold to this. This is what the Lord told me to tell you. He said, this is the season where God is going to let you know that despite the hardships you might be facing, you are not facing them alone. Okay, I, I need you to just spread this around the room, put it in the comment section, say, I'm not in this by myself. I wish I had some honest folk who understood that you, are, I don't care how lonely you feel, you are not in this situation by yourself. God is going to show you that you're not alone. And it seems as if those people that you trusted walked away. All of Jesus' compatriots are nowhere to be found. They're lurking in the shadows and Jesus feels like he's alone. And God assigns a Simon to carry the weight for Jesus. I, I need us to grab a hold of this. Jesus is... He cannot bear the weight of his own cross. So Simon is appointed to help him walk, perambulate, peregrinate, whatever word you want to use, the rest of the way. And this is what the Lord told me to tell you. It doesn't matter what state you're in right now. The Lord said to tell them help is on the way. Can you take about 30 seconds and lift up your voice and celebrate the fact that help is on the way? Matter of fact, just prophesy over your own life. Say, help is on the way. I've been struggling and things have gotten hard, but the good news is that help is on the way. God is going to assign somebody in this season of your life who will help you bear up the weight so you can make it to your destination. Help is on the way. The climb, this climb was necessary. It was mandatory that Jesus make this climb because his purpose could only be fulfilled if he chose to ascend. I need y'all to understand how costly it would have been for Jesus to abdicate his responsibility and say, I've gone far enough. But he understood that in order for him to fulfill his assignment, he said, I must get to the top of this hill. I got to get to the top of this mountain. And that's why Jesus said in John 12 and 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Okay, y'all, don't, don't, please don't miss this. Jesus said the only way I can draw them is if I'm elevated. 
I can only pull them in if I'm lifted up and I cannot be lifted up out of position. The cross can't be seen, watch this, the way it's supposed to be seen if, I get, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm hanged on a cross at the temple. No, Jesus said, I got to go up the hill where everybody can see. You got to understand that Jesus had to walk to the place where he was fully exposed so he could pull us. Okay, draw all men means you and 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 me. He said, I will draw all men unto me, but it only happens if I ascend. Woo-wee. I, he says, I'll draw them, I will pull them, I will, I will become the attracting force. Let me help you. Uh, all of us who, who, who have a, a desire to evangelize and to win the loss, it's not your testimony that's winning them. It's, it's an ascended Jesus. It's a lifted Jesus. Yes, he gave you the job and the job is a part of your testimony, but your job is not absent a lifted Christ. You, he, he, he healed you from sickness, but that's not the whole of your testimony. It's still the drawing force of a lifted Christ. Jesus understood if I'm going to change Jew and Gentile, if I'm going to change male and female, if I'm going to change slave and free, I can only do it if I'm lifted on the cross. He knew intrinsically that this mountain could not be removed. He knew this is a mountain I have to climb. This is a mountain I have to ascend. Listen to Jesus' testimony in John 17 and 5. Jesus says, and now, Father, glorify me along with yourself. Listen to this and restore me to the majesty and the honor I had in your presence from the beginning of time. Wait a minute. Jesus says, watch this, my desire is to be seated again. Try it one more time. Jesus says, Father, glorify me and yourself and put me back in the place of highest esteem. Remember, Philippians 3 tells us that Jesus humbled himself and took on the form of a man. Yes? And became obedient even to the death of the cross. Yes. So watch this. So we understand that Jesus chose to lower himself. He chose to take on the form of man which is lesser than who he is in totality. He emptied himself into a, a, a human box so he could die. But ultimately he says what I want is to take my seat again. So, Father, glorify me like I was glorified before the world existed, but I realize that I can only be glorified if I ascend. I can only take my seat again if I ascend. I'm almost done. Y'all all right? Most of, the, most of us would jump off the ship. This is the place where we would circumvent our responsibility if we were offered the opportunity when it comes time for us to hang on that cross. Most of us don't want to take up our cross as it is. But even if we do make it to the mountain, most of us are like, can, uh, can we do this another day? I, I, don't, I don't want to give up what I love, even though it's contrary to my purpose. I like him. I like her, even though it's contrary to my purpose. This enterprise that I have begun, it pays me a lot of money, but it don't glorify God. Can, can you take up your cross? When your cross means letting go of everything that's contrary to purpose. When your cross means releasing everything that makes you comfortable. You got to understand when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified naked. They took his garment 
and they left a, a, a bleeding, bloody, beaten man, put him on a cross with wounds in his back, wounds in his head, wounds in his hands, wounds in his feet. And they let him hang there until he asphyxiated. An excruciatingly painful death. And the only way Jesus could get air is he had to press on the feet that had nails in them. And he, would, he, would, he had to create pain to breathe. I need y'all to understand the level of sacrifice that Jesus made. And, and I promise you, most of us would say, eh, I'm not doing that. Especially if it ain't my fault I'm here. Yet, he took the climb. He took the suffering. He took the beating. This is what Paul says in Romans 8. He says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. I'm trying to help somebody here. The reason why you got to take the climb is because the glory comes after. Keep going up the mountain. There is some glory in it. Keep on walking. There's some glory. And I know you're tired. I know your legs are tired and your feet hurt and your back hurts. But keep going because there is glory after this. Somebody holler out, there's glory after this. The climb isn't always easy, but there is glory attached to it. It's also important for us to note that the ascent cannot happen unless you're first placed in a lower position. Try it again. You cannot climb from up there. You climb from down there. And some of us are regretting the position that we're in. We're asking God to switch it, but God is saying, I'm not going to switch it. I put you there so you could climb. Okay, y'all won't talk back to me. I left you in the valley on purpose. I'm not angry at you. I'm just bidding you to come up hither. Good God Almighty. Somebody put that in the comment section because that's what I hear the Lord saying. Tell somebody, say, it's time for you to come up here. There. It's time for you to make the climb. It's time for you to ascend. Come, come, come up hither. Come up to where I am. God will leave us down there until we recognize that all of our talking ain't moving this mountain. We will dance around the mountain. We will pray in tongues around the mountain. And the mountain will look at you like this. Not moving ain't going nowhere because that mountain needs your feet. I need you to understand that when Jesus finally gave up the ghost, he didn't, he was not killed. I, I, I want to be clear. He was crucified, but he wasn't killed. Try it one more time. He was hanged on a tree, but they did not kill him. Okay. Jesus said, no man takes my life. I have to volunteer it because even in my beaten and broken state they cannot kill me I'm too God to be killed but because death is a requirement I'll lay my life down I will give you what you want but not because you have the power to take it he says I lay it down but I need you to understand that if I put it down I can also pick it back up again I need you to tell your neighbor say he decided to die okay y'all didn't say that with no power with no conviction I need you to find somebody else and say he decided to die death was a choice Because Jesus understood what well, I made this ascent to the mountain called Calvary. There's one more climb I got to make. So he accepted death. He gave up the ghost. Woo. The Bible says he gave up the ghost. 
and he died. And but watch this. And the Bible says, and the earth responded to the death of its king. The Bible says there was a great earthquake. When Jesus died, I'm coming to Sunday, I'm, I'm going to get there. But when Jesus died, the Bible says the whole earth responded. The whole earth shook when its king gave up the ghost. And it shook dead people out of their grave. Okay, y'all got to understand that when Jesus died, one of the signs of his death was dead people say, Oh my God, he has to have the only, he's the only one that can get credit in this moment. Dead people got up and walked the earth because Jesus died. Jesus died. But the Bible says... He went into hell. I need y'all to grab a hold of this. Jesus died because death is the only way to access the dimension of hell. One more time. Jesus understood the only way to defeat hell is to go to hell. But the only way to get into hell was through the doorway called death. So watch this, Jesus ascended to go down. Okay, don't, don't, don't miss this. The reason why Jesus said, hang me on the cross is because I got to go down into hell. And the only way for me to get into hell is I got to die. So watch, he gave up the ghost so the door to hell would open. He goes into hell, and even Satan thinks, we got him now. Can you imagine the party that's happening in hell? When Jesus hangs his head, and he gives up the ghost, and, and for all appearances, they killed him. And Satan is saying, we finally got him. It took thousands of years, and we finally got him. And I can imagine a party happening in hell. I can imagine the red cups galore. Oh, Y'all won't talk, okay. Red cup party. Beer pong in hell. And here comes Jesus, not bound, not controlled, not under an influence but with power he walks into hell breaks up the party and says the only reason why I came here is because the only power I didn't have you had in hell okay y'all won't talk back to me Jesus had all power except keys there were two keys that he had to pick up from hell. Yes, he had power over demons. Yes, he had power over death. But there were still two keys that he was missing in his arsenal. It was the keys to death and hell. So the Bible says that Jesus went into hell. Listen to me. He went into hell so he could get his keys. Okay, you, you got to read Revelation 1 and 8 where Jesus says, I am he who once was dead and is alive and have keys to death, hell, and the grave. Okay, y'all got to grab a hold of this. Jesus, Jesus chose death because he had to get his keys back. So while Satan is partying in hell, Jesus shows up to disrupt Satan. And the Bible says in, uh, in the book of Colossians, chapter number 2, verse 15, it says, God disarmed the principalities and the powers that were ranged against us. Listen to this. And made a bold display. In the King James Version, it says, it made an open show and a public example of the powers and the principalities of hell and triumphing over them in Jesus Christ when he hanged on the cross. Wait a minute. So you mean to tell me Jesus ascended so he could descend, so he could disrupt Satan's power once and for all? Okay, y'all gotta grab a hold of this. 
Jesus went into hell to take the rest of Satan's power. Okay, I got to quit. My time is up. So watch this. Jesus goes into hell. And remember, the earth shook when he died. But in Matthew, y'all trying to figure out, well, why did he read Matthew? Here's why I read Matthew. That was all my introduction. This is a five-minute close. In Matthew, chapter number 28, the Bible says early Sunday morning. Somebody say Sunday morning. The reason why we in church celebrating because early Sunday morning, Jesus decided that it was time for him to come back. And the only reason why he stayed in hell as long as he did was because he told us in advance it was going to be three days. I remember my father preached a message one time, three days in hell is long enough. He spent three days in hell messing up Satan's agenda, proving to Satan that everything he did, it, it, it was rendered nothing. But when Jesus came back up, listen, this ascent was not as slow as his ascent when he was carrying the cross. Because this ascent, Jesus has all his power. Okay, I need y'all to hear me. Jesus has all his power. And the earth shook when he died, but the earth shook again when he got up. That's what Matthew 28 tells us, that the earth shook. And in this earthquake, the angel shows up, the stone is rolled away, and, and the guards who are guarding the, the, the borrowed tomb of Jesus, of Joseph of Ar uh, Arimathea, the borrowed tomb, the Bible says that the guards fall down as dead, and here comes Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and they show up at the tomb just to get a peek, maybe we can watch him come out of there. Okay, I, I need y'all to understand. And it, it's one of the things that irritates me about, oh, women aren't supposed to be in ministry. One of the things that irritates me about that, can, can I take a quick 30 second aside? One of the things that irritates me about that is that it was the women who kept their faith. While the men were all scared and, and bewildered. If you read in John chapter number 20, even Peter and John the beloved came to the, to the crypt and they still didn't believe Jesus got up. They thought his body had been stolen. But Mary and the other Mary was like, hey, where is he? Because we came to see a resurrection. We came to see him get up. Can I tell y'all one other thing? It's also women who were the first evangelists of Jesus being risen from the dead. That's right there in the text. Go and tell the men who are too scared to show up at the grave site that Jesus is no longer dead. If you go into that tomb, all you're going to see is a place where he used to be. Okay, y'all don't want to talk back to me. He, all you're going to do is tell them, I've seen the place where he was. Bible says that there was a great earthquake. What caused the earthquake? The second earthquake was because Jesus was switching dimensions. He was leaving hell and coming back into the earth realm. And the changing of dimensions of that kind of power made the earth shake. And the reason, I, this ain't in the Bible, this, how I, this, this is Jason, I'm Jasonizing now. But, but one of the reasons why I believe that they had to roll the stone away is because the force of Jesus' resurrection would have obliterated the stone. And they needed proof, watch this. They needed proof that something other than Satan was in charge of that moment. So he rolled the stone away as a relief valve. So that when Jesus came up, the earth shook, but it didn't destroy the tomb. Okay. The Bible says, listen to this, Jesus rises with all. And the reason why it's important that it tells us that he rose with all power is because he descended missing two keys. He got up with all 
power. I need you to understand that when Jesus rose up, the Bible says that he had a conversation with Mary, and Mary went to hug him, and he said, oh, no, 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 don't touch me. Because I haven't gone all the way up yet. Okay. Hear, hear me. Watch the text. The Bible says, this is in John 20, the Bible says that she went to embrace him. And Jesus says, you can't touch me yet because I've not ascended to my father. Oh, my God. One, one more time. Jesus says, my journey isn't finished until I go back home. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Listen to this. So, so the Bible says that Jesus ascends when he comes back. After he has taken his seat, he comes back to the earth to show the doubting men that he is alive. And to show the doubting men, watch this, if you take up your cross and if you ascend like I did, the same level of glory that I'm experiencing is the same level of glory that you will experience too. I'm here to tell somebody today, don't stop climbing. Uh, can, can, you tell your, can you tell your neighbor, put it in the comment section, tell somebody around you, say, don't stop climbing. Whatever you do, I need you to keep going up. There is a level of glory. There is a visible manifestation of the presence of God that is in store for you, but you cannot see it if you quit in the middle. There's a reason why Jesus said, I got to go back to my father. Because that's where the glory is. Remember, he said, restore to me the glory I had before the world existed. Jesus said, I, I remember what it was like. It's been 33 years in time. But I'm accustomed to eternity. Only reason why I came into time was to save mankind. Now I want to go back into eternity where the glory is. I need y'all to understand what God is doing in this hour. He's disrupting patterns. He's disrupting systems. He's disrupting the plans of the enemy. He's disrupting the arguments of other people. He's disrupting the pettiness. Okay, y'all won't talk back to me. He's disrupting the people who are stabbing you in the back. It don't matter. All he's telling you is keep coming up to me because when you get here, the pain of your crime will disappear because the glory will be evident in your life. Keep climbing. The glory of the ascent is that you didn't quit in the middle. Tell your neighbor, say, whatever you do, don't quit in the middle. Okay, you, you, ain't, you ain't got the right name because they didn't say anything in response. Find one more person, say, whatever you do, don't quit in the middle. Yet yeah, in the middle, you might lose your job. In the middle, you might not have enough money. In the middle, you might be a little bit sick. In the middle, your marriage may be on the rocks. In the middle, people may turn their backs on you. But if you can keep on climbing, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Climbing. And while you're climbing, you're going to get to the point where you, where you feel the shaking happening. I got to quit. But can you tell one more person, the last time I tell you to talk to your neighbor, to just nudge your neighbor and say, God's about to shake everything up. How you know you get, hallelujah, how you know you're getting to the top of the mountain is things start getting shaken up. How you know you're almost at the end is when the disruption starts shaking up the status quo. When the shaking happens, it means you're almost at the finish line. You're almost at the zenith. Keep walking until God shakes up some things. In Hebrews, God says, I've shaken it once and I will shake it again. Whatever does not belong, I will shake it off of you. Good God Almighty. In, the, in, in Ezekiel 37, when it talks about the revival of the dry bones, one of the things that happens is there is a noise and then there is a shaking. When the shaking happens, you know revival is about to hit your life. 
you know you're about to feel a glory you've never felt before I tell you to just shake yourself I just practice this is what the shaking is going to feel like the dust is going to fall off the problems are going to fall off the issues are going to fall off shake yourself this is the hour where the glory of the Lord is being revealed I know you've been struggling I know things have been askew but the Lord says keep climbing there is a glory in this climb that's going to reshape your life keep coming higher just as he was lifted up our responsibility is to keep going higher listen to the word of the Lord Jesus made this ultimate sacrifice for us to ensure, hear me, to ensure that nobody was left without the opportunity to say yes to a life with him. He made that sacrifice to give us an opportunity to live with him, changed in relationship, better, free from sin. How does it happen? It happens when we make a decision to say yes to God. If you're in this house today, if you're online today, and you don't know the Lord and the pardon of your sin, I'm here to tell you that the reason why Jesus came from heaven to earth is to die for you. I told you earlier that he did not just die for us, he died as us. 